Hey friends, welcome back to the journal feed. My name is Nick Zelt, and this is the only place to get spoon-fed the latest and greatest of emergency medicine. We are trying to make keeping up with the literature as easy as possible, and so we are here to spoon-feed you the latest research through your earbuds. Now, let's take a quick look ahead at everything that we covered from this week. First off, we saw what else could a CTPA even pick up? Second, more about outpatient treatment for COVID. Third, nerve block for headaches. That's right, I said nerve blocks for headaches. Ah, I love nerve blocks. Fourth, we've heard the debate between balanced fluids and saline, but what about in children? And then fifth, so you diagnosed a PE. Okay, well, you know, now what? If you're hearing this, then you are not currently a Journal Feed subscriber and so are not receiving the full Journal Feed podcast. You're only receiving a portion of the past week's summaries. Don't worry though, I pick my favorites, but if you would like to get full access to both the podcast and the blog, then you will need to become a member. All the details for that are at journalfeed.org, where if money is a problem, just reach out to us. We never want money to be a barrier to patient care. We could probably help you out. Now, this is the audio version of the past week summaries, which were brought to you by the strong Bo Stubblefield, Lauren Murphy, Megan Hilbert, Megan Breed, Rebecca Breed, and Clay Smith. All right, let's go to the first article titled Valence and Significance of Incidental Findings on Computed Tomography Pulmonary Angiograms, a Retrospective Cohort Study out of the American Journal of Emergency Medicine. Overimaging in PE is kind of a huge problem. The US is actually worse than most places with a diagnostic yield as low as 1 to 3% in some studies. The rates of PEs are seemingly rising. So you'd think that this number would be higher, but unfortunately it's not. Also, the PEs that we are finding on average, kind of as a whole, they're less severe than they used to be. So with tests comes results. Even if they're not necessarily warranted tests, you're still going to get some results. So if we're doing all of these scans but aren't finding PEs, what on earth are we finding? This was a retrospective study of over 2,000 patients with CTPAs that were negative for a PE. In these scans, 75%, two-thirds of these scans, had at least one incidental finding. Okay, now that's a lot, but there's more. 40% of these scans offered an alternative diagnosis. The top three alternative diagnoses were pneumonia, fluid overload, and a pleural effusion. These rates of finding an alternative diagnosis were even more common in admitted to the hospital patients and ICU patients than in emergency department patients or outpatients. And I can't help but notice that all three of these diagnoses, or the very least two of them, can be made quite confidently with POCUS. This study does well to highlight the differences in patient populations, though, since most studies are not going to include patients that are from, well, inpatients, ICU, emergency department, and outpatients. It also doubles down on the importance of using decision aids as first line. Fun fact, though, this is not the first time that we've shown that pneumonia is the most common alternative diagnosis for PE. There are studies all the way back to 2009 showing the exact same thing but it seems like we haven't quite changed our ways. In a spoonful, CTPAs done to assess for PEs frequently find an alternative diagnosis. This was more common in older patients and in inpatients. But you know, I bet that the doctors ordering these tests are probably aware of this. It's kind of a nice two birds with one stone. After all, as we're accepting that contrast every day, we're seeing that it's less and less dangerous, but you know, radiation, that's just never going to be good for you. In a spoonful, CTPAs done to assess for PEs frequently find an alternative diagnosis. And this was more common in older patients and in inpatients. All right, we're going to skip over number two and go to number three. Titled Effectiveness of Peripheral Nerve Blocks for the Treatment of Primary Headache Disorders, a Systematic Review and Meta-Analysis out of the Annals of Emergency Medicine. Somewhere around one in 50 patients in the emergency department are showing up because of a primary headache disorder. That is, a non-traumatic, but probably painful, but not dangerous headache. One of my favorite ways to control pain is nerve blocks. The head is filled with neurons, and also covered with them, so why don't we block some? These authors did a systematic review of randomized control trials evaluating the efficacy of peripheral nerve blocks versus placebo. 
They found nine suitable papers, but with pretty significant heterogeneity in the primary and secondary outcomes, as well as the dosages and techniques. What they found in this review was that there was a significant decrease in pain scores at 50 minutes and 30 minutes, with some pretty nice p-values too. But the mean differences were on the magnitude of about 1 point out of 10 on a visual analog scale, with none of these studies even trying to assess for clinically significant changes. All the same, there were changes though. My experience with this personally is that some patients get immediate amazing relief, while others have little to no effect. So it's part of the armamentarium, but it's not going to be a cure-all by any means. As for how to actually do some of these blocks, well, these studies run the greater occipital nerve block and the sphenopalatine ganglion block. Well, let's go over how to do them because they're really quite easy. For the greater occipital nerve block, honestly, I'd say just Google a picture of it. The landmarks are really quite easy. You can palpate for the point of maximal tenderness and just go there, or you can go one third of the way from the occipital protuberance to the mastoid process and then inject some local anesthetic right there. It's going to be pretty easy. Next is the sphenopalatine ganglion block, which is a bit more annoying to do. You're going to have to lay your patient down in the sniffing position and soak a cotton tip applicator in local anesthetic and then guide that into the nose along the superior border of the middle turbinate until it contacts the mucosa over the sphenopalatine ganglion. You want to do this on both sides probably. Also, a cardiac monitor is a good idea since with any patient that you're, well, sticking things up their nose, they have the potential to go vagal. Always, with any local anesthetics, be careful of toxic doses, but you should be pretty far away from that here since you're just soaking some sponges. In a spoonful, it may be the most fun way to treat a headache, but peripheral nerve blocks probably aren't going to overthrow all the other treatments. Alright guys, let's do our wrap up. First off, if you don't find a PE with your CTPA, you're still likely to find something else. Which is kind of nice because at least, well, we're not wasting scans even if the rate of PEs that we're finding is kind of, well, it's pretty low. Then from the third article, you could try a peripheral nerve block on your next tricky primary headache patient. I wouldn't go forgetting your other management options though, since this method probably isn't ready for the first lines, you know? And that's the end of our wrap-up. Links to all the articles summarized can be found at journalfeed.org. The newsletter is the best way to make the podcast into a nice little bit of space repetition, so, you know, share it with your friends. Now, if you feel like you're missing out, you'd like to get more of what you just heard, then come over and join us in the members feed. All the details for that are also at our website, journalfeed.org. Our goal here is to provide better patient care through spoon feeding, and so we're trying to help you keep up with the latest research, one spoonful at a time. Thank you.